At Clockwork, we build robots for self-care. Our first robot is the world's first and only nail painting robot. So what if we create dots of polish next to each other in a way that like mesh together, that'll create the smooth coat. That was sort of like a big breakthrough moment for us. Like, all right, this is how we're going to paint nails. I'm Brett Gibson and welcome to iBit, a new podcast where we do deep dives on the art of problem solving with engineers and technical experts from our community of early stage startups. In today's episode, we're in our San Francisco office with Renika Apti, founder and CEO of Clockwork, a startup building AI-powered nail painting robots. A high bit is the most significant part of the binary representation of a number. In coder jargon, it commonly refers to the most important thing you need to understand in a given context. I chose to name this podcast High Bit because when faced with engineering problems, the first task is often figuring out which part of the problem most affects the outcome you are driving towards. Join me on this journey as we discuss thorny engineering problems with my guests and get into the weeds about how they solve them. Welcome, Ranika. Thank, thanks a lot for joining us today. Um, maybe we can start by telling us what Clockwork does. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, at Clockwork, we build robots for self-care. Uh, our first robot is the world's first and only nail painting robot. I'm really interested and curious to hear about what you know. it sounds like, all the amount of engineering that goes into making something like that quick and painless. <laughs> <laughs> we, for yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so, speak, speaking of your background, maybe you can go into you know, like what, what, what makes you suited for this problem. Yeah, I mean, I've been an engineer all my life. Uh, I started out uh, as a systems engineer at NVIDIA, um, and I was doing device drivers there. And slowly I moved sort of up the tech stack. Um, just before Clockwork, I was leading infra teams at Dropbox. Um, so one of my teams uh, wrote the file watcher layer that looks for changes across Dropbox's 700 million users and God knows how many devices. Um, and then the other team did the infra for file previews. So anytime you click on a Dropbox link, uh, there's a file preview generated um, and that's how you view your file on Dropbox. But this was like truly the first time I was stepping much further out into hardware. Uh, although I've done things like chip bring up at NVIDIA, uh, this isn't quite the same thing with motion components. Awesome. And then, so were you curious about robotics or how, you know, how did you come to this problem? Was it, was it because you wanted to solve something or was it because you wanted to work with robots? I think it was more of a journey for us. Uh, my co-founder and I, uh, we've known each other 10 years. Um, you know, we were together at Dropbox and before that we were early engineers uh, at a startup that was doing machine learning infra. Uh, and really we had given ourselves about a year and a half to just have like an extended hackathon, right? We were uh, building a bunch of things, experimenting with a bunch of ideas uh, with the intention of really killing them as quickly as possible. Uh, to make sure that what we were working on was really impactful. And the big thing that we found was how robotics was changing. So we felt that robots were going to come out of factories and very prescriptive environments into real life. And that presented a ton of challenges, but also a really big opportunity. And did you start off from a point of um, you know, you were curious if you could make this work or you, you assumed it was tractable. Like, what was your mentality in, in starting to tackle the problem? Yeah, I think um, our mentality was very much like killing the idea as quickly as possible. Uh, because, I mean, for us, ultimately, it is an opportunity cost, right? Um, so that, I think, was a, a really valuable lesson. Like, don't spend time building the things you know. Mm -hmm. Go straight for the things that you think are riskiest about this particular problem and make sure that you can solve it. So in this particular case, I would say roughly there were three areas that we wanted to make sure we can do. One is to get good clean edges, because if the robot paints worse than what you can do for yourself at home, yeah. it's not really worth it, right? Uh, the second was, can we create a smooth coat? Now it turns out this is actually really hard even for a human to do. If you've ever like painted anything or taken a graffiti class, like getting a smooth layer of paint is actually a really hard thing even for a human. Um, so doing this with a machine was, was definitely gonna be challenging. And then the third thing was the business model, right? How do we get 
a sub millimeter accuracy machine working in an unpredictable environment at the right price point. So that's sort of how we broke it down and like we straight went and tried to build the easiest thing first, right? So in the, um, as an example, in the clean edges idea, we were like, okay, let's use an off the shelf AI model. So Facebook Detectron had just launched at the time. Uh, clearly we're dating ourselves now, <laughs> uh, but uh, that was sort of the state of the art um, in image segmentation. So we were like, where, how well can this detect nails? And it got within the ballpark. So yeah, so it sounds like you were using computer vision like pretty early on before it was in widespread adoption. Maybe you can talk about you know, the, how you came to it and what, what state the technology was in. For sure. I think this, you're right, this was really, really early. We were um, around late 2018 uh, when we started working on this problem. The thing was, the state of the art at that time, like I said, was Detectron. Um, and so we tried using that, but really the use case was very different. The AI at that time um, was very focused on autonomous vehicles. And so they didn't care about like sub millimeter edges. You're never driving that yeah. close to anyone. Um, so really we had to roll out our own um, networks to be able to focus on that piece. Um, and Another aspect of that is data, right? Good data leads to better models. Um, and what we realized was that the labeling tools at that time were also not quite meant for our use case. We wanted our labels to showcase certain things that would make it easier on our AI. Um, and so for that, we actually rolled out our own labeling tool, uh, hilariously based on a gaming engine, <laughs> uh, because uh, I think, I mean, just reusing code made a lot of sense. Uh, but this allowed us to actually label in the way that we wanted. Um, and effectively, we ended up uh, getting to parity with the older models with a tenth of the, the data. And this was critical, again, from a cost perspective, because labeling is expensive, from a timing perspective, because collecting all of that data ex is expensive. But it just got us such better results as, uh, because of using you know, our own data set and our own um, network. So that was, I think, critical in getting those results really quickly and really early. Um, and going forward, I think we're going to keep using AI for things like uh, movement detection, right? We do have to react to uh, customers moving around. You know, they'll pull out their phones, they might sneeze. Yeah, that's interesting. It sounds like each thing, each, everything you solve led to a new set of novel problems. 100%. And I think that that was, um, that ability to iterate quickly was sort of our biggest asset because we created a platform in the process that let us like switch out components, mm -hmm. switch out uh, methodologies and just like keep going, uh, keep making progress. Was there a step that you feel like you spent the most amount of time and depth on? You know, or I mean, it's it's interesting because it's like every every part of this problem is hard and novel. For sure, I think uh, the first thing to get right was really paint methodology, mm -hmm. and uh, one of our breakthrough moments, I would say, was uh, relating the problem through to a three D printer, mm -hmm. um, and also sort of like marrying that idea to a dot matrix printer, like how it paints. Uh, and we were like, we can actually use things like the surface tension of nail polish, which was by this point a huge problem for us because it wouldn't go where we wanted it to go. Yeah. It would just adhere to itself. We were like, we can use that as an opportunity. So what if we create dots of polish next to each other in a way that like mesh together that will create the smooth coat? And so uh, my co-founder actually just went off uh, to a lab and used a pipette to like dispense drops of polish and see that they merge. And that was sort of like a big, um, you know, breakthrough moment for us. Like, all right, this is how we're going to paint nails. And that, that's approximately what we do even today. There's a whole bunch of things that went into it after that. But, uh, you know, we called it pointillism <laughs> based on the, uh, the art form. Uh, so the first version of the robot was called Sura after yeah. uh, the pointless painter. You know, it's interesting because you, you think the robot's just figuring out a path, but it's also what humans are doing is 
predictive of how nail polish behaves, you know, after it's applied. So, so you got to this point of let's let's do something akin to pointillism. How did how did you like? What was the process for refining that? to you know, the, the level of <laughs> painting you're able to do today? Yeah, um, so the next thing to figure out was how to localize the robot, right? Like how to actually get it to go where you wanted it to. Um, and we had to do this with cheap hardware in this like wild environment out there. Um, and just as an example of that, like we, one of our robots was kept in front of the frozen aisle at Target. And so the ACs would go on and off during the day and that would create like a pretty big variation in temperature. And you'll be surprised just how much that affects cameras that are supposed to be high accuracy. Like it actually throws off their readings and they, they sort of like give you a very different baseline under different temperatures. And so we built the system in a way to just assume that that was going to be the case, right? People were going to bump into the robot. We'd have to swap hardware uh, out there in, in the real world. So you know what? Why don't we make calibration just a part of daily life? Like, let it run automatically. Let it, let's make it quick and uh, let's make it something like super low effort that the robot can just do wherever. Uh, and that I actually like was a big... Um, uh, I, I think that was a big way that we could iterate really quickly, but also it just like dropped down cost because, um, you know, all of our servicing became a lot easier with that idea. Um, and even that idea, you know, like we started with 2D uh, first, uh, and this was actually, again, like a big lesson, like reduce the constraints on your problems mm -hmm. in a smart way, solve them in that space, and then add the additional constraints. So we w our like early setup for doing 2D localization was like super rudimentary. We literally had one webcam and a paper on which we used to like draw out targets. And we would make sure that at the end of our calibration routine, the robot could get to that target really quickly. And we almost went all the way to like painting nails, images of nails in 2D yeah. before we took on the third dimension. And I think that this was very important because if we had gone straight to 3D, I think we would have given up. There were so many things obfuscating our assumptions in 3D, mm -hmm. like steepness of nails, um, like polish flowing off of sides uh, of, of steep nails, uh, all kinds of like literally surface tension affecting where the polish would go, even if you made the end effector go exactly where you wanted it to go. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had sort of seen all of that together all at once, I think we would have just been like, our methodology is long, wrong, yeah. let's not do this. Yeah. Um, but because we could show that it works in 2D and then go into uh, add the third dimension, I think we were very systematic about isol isolating the components. Mm -hmm. It's funny because it's like there's this natural sort of engineer tendency to want things right in mm -hmm. some sense, like mm -hmm. right. Like mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. we, we were working on Postresses we had these servers that would um, they had like t terrible memory leaks, mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. we're like, we need to fix this memory leak. Mm -hmm. And then someone was like, why don't we just restart them every, <laughs> every twenty minutes? And, and it was like, for a minute, from a pure like deliver value perspective, that yeah. was kind of the right answer. One hundred percent. I think that that kind of mentality goes a really long way in practice. Um, I feel like we run into this kind of thing even on the AI side. Like it's very, I think people are enamored by this idea of like, let's actually solve the big problem, yeah. right? And making it easier on your AI goes such a long way in practice, like in, along the same lines. Like if you know that it's supposed to be looking at this thing, why are you giving it the whole world, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think it, those kinds of lessons definitely do help. Yeah, and actually, I mean, it seems like it dovetails into the way you design things for machine learning and sort of deep learning generally, because you kind of can't reason about what it's doing, and so it's really it's really about um, focusing on um, effectiveness and like delivering the solution and just like having intuitions about what what how you tease it in the right direction to do what you want. Absolutely right, constraining the problem. I think the thing that you brought out about. Um, unpredictability or like the lack of visibility into why AI is making a certain decision. Uh, one of our core things is to use AI only in safe ways. 
Um, so our path plan ends up being more classical algorithms mm -hmm. um, and the AI is only doing things like figuring out what is nail and what is skin um, or what is a certain part of a nail that has to be treated a different way. It'll never do things like actually decide what the path plan is. So worst case, in the rare occasions, if the AI decides like one part of your skin is actually nail, all you will get is a little bit of paint on that part of your skin, which you can wipe right off. So it doesn't create like any disastrous, like, oh, the path plan just like went off in this one direction and we don't know why it's yeah. like quirky AI doing <laughs> its thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, also, it's, I'm struck by the number of things that are going on inside of a nail painting robot. And so <laughs> even the concept of isolating in itself is probably a little bit hard in your methodology of figuring out what to tweak next. Uh, for sure. I think isolation has been, at every layer, one of the biggest um, things we did right, I want to say. We actually used a lot of concepts that came from software infra land in the hardware world. For example, designing shim layers around things. And that shim layer in hardware is the reason why we can swap out a camera in a Target store. Like I've literally, with no tools, switched a camera while we were live at Target, uh, while I was in the store. Oh, wow. um, and with like no like real background in mechanical engineering, um, I, I've just been able to do that because of some of these um, shim layers that we designed. And that also let us isolate things. So we could go from one kind of camera to a different kind of camera as we were iterating uh, because of this kind of approach. Uh, so that isolation actually works tremendously well um, in, in building anything practically. It helps us debug really quickly as well because we're like, oh, this is the component that's actually causing issues. Um, and so we don't have to worry about the rest of the system. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I assume you have to be very intentional about that because with this sort of this, level of symph symphony going on in the device <laughs> like you know like you need to uh, if you're not thinking if you're not thinking clearly about isolation you're just going to be in, in whack-a-mole where you don't really know what's breaking next or why absolutely um i i would say another thing that uh helped along those lines is recording anything that moves this sounds really <laughs> dumb yeah, yeah. but it's like very very um simple stuff like you don't even need any fancy like video uh, quality like uh, you just you can do this with like basic webcams mm -hmm. right record everything that moves because you'll be surprised how physics messes with software engineering assumptions like i remember a time when we spent like a whole day just like reasoning about how can this robot be causing this like weird intermittent issue that we are seeing um, and we thought of through all of the software stack and we're like this just can't happen like what's going on and then we recorded it and we realized that there was a wire getting caught just in <laughs> one particular move yeah. that was like affecting it just so so that the rest of the steps sort of got missed um, and yeah i think um, that is a very humbling lesson for a software engineer mm -hmm. that as soon as like hardware enters um, all of this like clean uh, software deterministic environment that you're used to being in all gets sort of tossed out of the picture. So. Yeah, if we were to summarize, you know, some of the major learnings in all this process, it sounds like isolation is certainly a theme. A lot of, um, you know, just like logging and data are a theme. Like, how, you know, how, what are your biggest takeaways? I think um, you're absolutely right about isolation. Um, I think just recording everything that moves uh, and basically adding a ton of telemetry. And uh, this actually, again, my background as uh, a software engineer who had to keep systems up a bunch uh, helped a lot in this regard where we have telemetry built in from day one, right? We have things going into um, a database that are like accumulating readings so that we we just know the health of various systems really quickly and w most of the problems that we can encounter on the field we can debug really quickly so really having those uh, debug level steps documented uh, and when i say documented i literally mean like visualizations of the path plan right and uh, visualizations of what the ai saw and what we decided to do 
all of that can just be sort of uh, pushed to uh, you know the cloud and ultimately to our dashboards so that anyone remotely can look at it and say, oh, this is exactly what happened during this appointment and this is what's going on. And so we can actually provide live support. And if we see that somebody is like moving or having trouble just uh, getting a good code, we're able to like tell them exactly what they need to change in that moment in order to uh, make the service work really well. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of like the remote sort of debugging. <laughs> um, have, like has, in terms of like context of, that you were solving all this under, is it, is, is it mostly just been you and your co-founder sort of figuring problems out? How big is the team and like what are the resources that or have you leaned on? Early on, so last year, for example, we had seven robots out in the wild, and we had a smaller team full-time than robots in the wild. We had only six people, um, and it was mostly my co-founder, our founding engineer. Uh, he, his background is on the mechanical, engineers, uh, mechanical engineering side, um, and then another mechanical engineer. Um, so that was like really the engineering team for the longest time until we felt like, all right, we've de-risked a lot of the issues here and now we just need to grow, right? Now we, we actually need to scale this, we need to do it reliably. Like this is where the classic software engineering comes in. And so now the software engineering team is starting to grow. So we have two people who joined since then, a third person joining um, in June. Um, some of the service engineering team is also starting to grow. So folks who are actually responsible for field operations. Because this year we're actually already contracted to grow 7x wow. from last year. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of like focusing on operations, focusing on just like high quality robustness out there in the field. And so what are, what are we going to see next from Clockwork? What, what should we look forward to? So we just launched a robot at JFK Airport. This is a partnership with Xwell. This was a company formerly called Express Spa. They have 35 locations uh, all over the world, uh, most of them in the US. And they really want us to take uh, us to almost all of their locations uh, because they are very focused on sort of this like digital, uh, more autonomous uh, services, especially in airport situations. Um, so that's a, a partnership that I'm super excited about. Uh, there's another airport partner that we're going to announce very soon. Uh, and then mostly we're growing as corporate amenities in um, existing buildings. So we were at Rockefeller Center, that was our first robot, and the owners, Tishman Spire, are now putting us in about 12 more locations. So the second of them was uh, the LinkedIn building in San Francisco. There's another one coming in SF, another one coming in LA. So it's just, it's really uh, moving pretty quickly now. Wow, that's awesome. That sounds like you're gonna be everywhere. <laughs> I mean, that's like, the dream, right? Well, like help. make it as easy <laughs> as grabbing a cup of coffee. Yeah. Uh, that's really where we want to go. Cause that's when it becomes really a no brainer for you to get that few minutes of delight in the day that makes you feel put together, that makes you feel good about yourself. That's the dream. Awesome. This has been this has been really really fascinating. I feel like I've learned a lot about nail painting and robots. So that's that's kind of remarkable. Thanks a lot, Renika. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. That's it for this episode and season of High Bit. If you liked what you heard, please reach out and tell us who you want us to interview next. We're interested in speaking with technical experts solving hard problems at early stage startups. We succeed, we'll be the first commercial company to ever go out to deep space. 30 years of electronification in the finance industry, we're trying to go through in five years. These pieces like click in your head and you're just like, oh my God, like internet money with no middlemen and it's like cryptographically secure. It's mind blowing. Our first robot is the world's first and only nail painting robot. That was sort of like a big breakthrough moment for us. Like, all right, this is how we're going to paint nails. High Bit is produced by Initialized Capital. Our videographer and editor is Jordan Burns. Candy Chang is our showrunner. And I'm your host, Brett Gibson. Thanks for listening.